before I dive in and talk about Survivor Series, let me get a couple of things off my chest. First of all, you weren't in fucking Chicago. Stop pretending like you were. I know you've been doing this for damn near 40 years, but Rosemont, Chicago, not the same thing, I promise you. The Rosemont politics may be as crooked and corrupt as Chicago's have been historically, but not the same place. So stop it. Number two, this is a big one. As much as I want to like the war games concept, no matter how much WWE tries with a main roster show with NXT, I just can't get into it. It's something I will always associate with WCW. Always feel like it will belong in a WCW pay-per-view. Just not my jam here. Sorry. And then number three. I have grown to really detest and flat out loathe the Peacock viewing experience. From the random spinning and buffering during the event, you can't go back when you're watching it live and catch up on something or rewatch something because why the fuck would you expect a major streaming service to do that? And then to top it all off, for people like me who don't watch the fucking weekly shows because they're mostly ass now, not getting the video packages to explain why the hell these matches are happening and why the hell we should give a fuck. Because you're not subscribed to pre -co Peacock Premium, blah, blah, blah. Like, couldn't you jam these ads in other ways? I'm just fucking saying. Anyways, let's talk about Survivor Series War Games. And of course, since it's equal opportunity, we got a pillar to post with two fucking War Games matches. And the first one was the women's one. And I don't care how much people are going to try and tell me they really enjoyed this if they did more power to them. But I was bored as fucking shit. The psychology of this match is so goddamn stupid. War games traditionally, you have the heel team that has the person advantage. Kind of a tried and true formula. So of course, the babyface team has the woman advantage throughout the match. The heel team's the one that's doing the most spectacular spots. You got EO Sky doing the dumb shit in the fucking garbage can, which looked like trash. <laughs> well, guess it was trash. Could you imagine? Like, what's the appeal of that move? Seriously. But they're the ones doing this shit. They're the ones that have the disadvantage, but you're supposed to boo them? Really? Meanwhile, the babyface team has fucking Charlotte Flair on it. In Shitsy. Shitsy just sucks, but Charlotte Flair is on a whole different level of botchy bitch. She can't even run to the fucking ring right. The first move she hits is a fucking botch. A goddamn moonsault off the top of the fucking uh, war games cage. She almost overshot every goddamn buddy. And then her and Becky Lynch combined. I can't just put this on the botchy bitch herself. They couldn't even fucking execute a basic put a, pull him in hog right. The fuck is going on here? How do you fuck up a hog? Everything about this is just dumb. The psychology is off. You don't give a shit about the majority of the people in this fucking match. And of course, the babyface team wins, which really makes them the heel team and the heel team the babyface team because the heel team was the one that had to overcome the odds and they couldn't do it, but they were the ones that did the most crowd-pleasing, spectacular shit in the match. Oh, I guess that's the Triple H booking genius. Oh, praise God. And how dare I blaspheme him against everything that is in the books of the Hunter, the Hearst, and the Helmsley, right? Ah, fuck off. Anyways. Thank God we eventually got over that 30, 40 fucking minutes later. The Intercontinental Championship. The Miz versus Gunther. I did enjoy this one. Miz as a plucky underdog babyface doesn't work. It's never going to work. But him nutshotting Gunther a couple of times and using wily, crafty tricks to make this a competitive match against Gunther by surprise, I was totally down for. This was better than I thought it had any business being except for the fact that I know Miz is really fucking good. And maybe someday, someday, Gunther 
can actually work at his craft and be on the same level as The Miz. And I even liked a little bit of storytelling there at the end. Wasn't it Gunther that beat Jericho, or I almost said Jericho, <laughs> beat Miz with the Lion Tamer so that way Miz doesn't get the ninth Intercontinental Championship? Nice little storytelling touch there. That was good shit. Solid match. Santos Escobar versus Dragon Lee. I really didn't give a fuck about. You're not going to give me Rey Mysterio. You're not going to give me Carlito. That's not fucking cool. Dragon Lee, they're hyping him up. What's so special about him? Maybe, just maybe, when you put aside the mask piece, if he was doing shit that dozens of other wrestlers, male and female, don't already do on the fucking roster, main roster NXT, like, maybe I would give a shit. Instead, I don't. I see some potential in Santos Escobar. I'm not going to get head over heels about his potential right now, but he won. Who cares next? Yo, know, Rhea Ripley, Zoe Stark, Women's World Championship. As far as Rhea Ripley goes, you know, you're supposed to buy that Zoe Stark had a chance again. This is like pretending that Survivor Series was actually in Chicago tonight. No matter how much you say it, no matter how much you try to pretend it's so, it just ain't fucking true. That's true. It's damn true. I wish they could give Rhea Ripley some, you know, like, valid, legitimate, believable competitors. And for those that are going to say Jade Cargill, yeah, absolutely. But you give me too much of a buildup to that fucking match and I'm going to fucking erupt. And when that match would come at WrestleMania, i probably come more than once. And I'm not the only one, goddammit, so don't just look at me as a pervy old man. But this match, Ripley and Zoe Stark, probably was the worst match of the night, right? I think it had to be. It was in kind of a no-win spot. It wasn't a match that people really cared about. Rhea Ripley looked banging as always. Her makeup, I'm not, not huge on it, but whatever. Mommy's always on top, to which a lot of fellows would be like, you could do whatever you want to be, pegging goddess. Oh, thumb dom my ass. You could, you could be my fin dom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, y'all thought the Schleg Daddy didn't know about that shit. Fuck out of here. Anyways. <laughs> it was all a one-match show. Let's be completely honest here. All the speculation and build-up here was about, was Randy Orton going to come back? Was CM Punk going to show up? That's all you fucking cared about. That's it. Right? Now, personally, I thought uh, there was a huge missed opportunity when Dom Mysterio came out and the crowd was already fired up to boo him with the heat that he has and is magnificent. I wish he would have taken a moment when he got out of the cage and thrown everybody really off the scent by sitting here and hitting the ground and saying it's clobbering time. It's something his father, Eddie Guerrero, would have done if he's working heel. I'm just saying his dad is looking down, very disappointed in him right now. Just saying. Um, yeah. The match was the match, but at least the psychology here was better, right? The babyface team had the disadvantage. Judgment Day, the heel faction that's worked together, plus Drew McIntyre thrown in, obviously. They had the man advantage throughout the match. This is how it's supposed to fucking work. And that's why this match works so much better. Because your heels get some heat on the baby face, they get the advantage, then the next baby face comes in and evens up the fucking odds. It's basic fucking psychology. Couldn't fucking do that with the women's match, so God forbid. But everybody was just waiting after, until Dominic came out, and then you're like, it's three minutes to find out whether or not he's coming in. By God! He fucking did. And I know a lot of you are going to sit there and say, wait a second. 
I remember you as the guy back in 2011 that did the 15 Reasons Randy Orton Sucks video. That's how I know about you. You have blasted this guy for years. You've talked all types of glorious shit about him and Cena and the Breakfast Club and all this other crap. Yeah, all of that is true and none of that fucking matters. Because Randy Orton was there. By God, he was jacked. If you're going to be gone for a year and a half, you come back looking different. And that's what he fucking did. He hit them Flintstone vitamins, them Python protein packs, brother. The Viper had some pythons, dude. Holy shit. But you could just feel the star power. You could just feel. I would never say charisma. You could feel the presence, though. Like, this is a big fucking deal. It's sh the Chicago-ish crowd, the Rosemont, Illinois crowd, gave him a huge fucking reaction, which he fucking deserved, because this is a big thing. He's been gone for a long time. And then when he comes in, he's hitting the power slams, and eventually he hits his first RKO. The place goes bananas. And then when J.D. McDonough climbs up to the top and you say, oh, we know where this is fucking going. And he hits, kind of hits the RKO like that. I mean, it was curtains from there. I mean, that's how you do it. That's breakfast club business. Be the big fucking attraction, short, sweet, and to the point, And get in, get out, and get over your shit. So, Team Rhodes wins. Of course, Cody just has to get the fucking pinfall. He still ain't beating them John China allegations. So, you think, hey, that's it. Randy Orton actually did show up. We're not getting swerved. It's not LA Knight or some other dumb shit. You know, LA Knight would have been cool. Everything else would have been dumb, but it still would have been a bad spot for LA Knight. But you're thinking, okay, it's Randall. There you go. And then, just before the show ends, here's Cult of Personality. Here's fucking CM Punk. Holy shit. Like, to go from Randy Orton to that drama, and he actually shows up and seals the deal, if you will, and puts that match over the top, to then CM Punk coming out and saying, can you top this? Yes, I fucking can. What a hell of a closing, like, 10 to 15 minutes of Survivor Series. Most of the rest of the paper, pff, I could do without. This feels like, if I'm being honest, a Vince pay-per-view, doesn't it? Most of the rest of the show sucks. The psychology is off in several of the matches, and then you get to the main event, and you get a couple of big returns from the Wonder Twins of the past. And you think about it. CM Punk, age 45. Randall Keith Orton, 43. These two Wonder Twins are in for big things in their future. The best is yet to come. But don't get it twisted. Don't get distracted. Don't take your eyes off the prize, Randall. CM Punk is a big deal. CM Punk wants to face you. But you've got bigger fish to fry. WrestleMania 40. Once in a lifetime. This time it counts. Versus John Cena. Career threatening match. It needs to happen. It has to happen. The Philly crowd fucking will demand it. But anyway. Tell me where I'm wrong. But this felt like a Vince McMahon book WWE pay-per-view. Two and a half hours of you really don't give much of a fuck and you're trying to fumble fuck through and pretend like you give a shit. And the last 10 to 15 minutes kind of hook you and get you to almost forget that the rest of the show was mostly a large waste of time. But at least if nothing else, you got some type of cliffhanger that makes you actually want to tune in to WWE television this upcoming Monday and this upcoming Friday because you say, holy shit, Randy Orton's back, CM Punk's back. This feels like the true start to WrestleMania season this time. And my God, can you imagine what that lineup's going to look like at Royal Rumble? 